نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار <coughs> Brothers and sisters This afternoon I'd like to ask everybody a question And that question is that if you gave something that was very dear to you, something that was very precious, something that was very valuable, if you gave that to someone to take care of for a little while as a trust, you would expect that when they return that particular thing to you that you had given to someone to take care of, that they would give it back to you like they received it. And if you did not get it back the way that you had given it, whatever thing you gave, whether it's a car, or a house, or a computer, whatever, or your jewelry, whatever, you gave it to somebody to hold on to, and to take care of it, until you come back, until you receive it back. But if the person gave it back to you, deformed or damaged in some way, no doubt you would be very upset. You would be very upset. You would be very disappointed. Brothers and sisters, in the same way, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a trust, has given us something that is very valuable, extremely valuable. It's a trust that Allah has given us. And that trust is our children, our children. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He gives us, when He blesses us with children, 
we are so happy. We celebrate, we have the aqiqah and so on and so forth. And we're really happy. But yet, it's a trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Each one of these children, each one of these kids is born with a fitrah. It is that nature, that innate nature, that Allah has endowed them with, through which they recognize the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that is innate. And they know right from the very beginning that there is only <coughs> one God. They're born with that fitrah. They're born with that human nature. And these children, if they're brought up in the right way, if they're brought up in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can be the glamour of this world. They can be the pleasures of this world. But if these children are brought up in a way that is alien to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is hostile to the way of the Qur'an, to the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it could be a source of trial. As the Qur'an calls it, fitna. إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna. Surely, your wealth and your children are nothing but fitna, trial. Trial. But on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْمَالُ وَالْبَنُونَ زِينَةُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Your wealth and the children are the lights of the life of this world. The glitter and the glamour, the pleasures of this, the, the, uh, they're a sense of amazement and a, a, a sense of amusement. So what distinguishes these opposite trends? They could either be trouble or trial, or they could be treasures. That's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la takhunu Allah wa rasool, wa takhunu amanatikum wa antum ta'lamun. O you who believe, do not betray Allah do not cheat Allah and the Messenger and thereby betray your trusts. And you know what you're doing. So if we raise our children according to what is pleasing to Allah through the guidelines of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, then they can be a source of treasure. Not only in this world, but also in the hereafter. However, if we raise them in a way that is in conflict with the Qur'an and with the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, then they are trials and troubles in our lives. The issue is trust. This is a trust. The ki the ki these kids, these children have been given to us as a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The issue is that eventually when you send them back to Allah, when they will go back to Allah, are they going to go back in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them to you? With that pure heart? with a clean fitrah? Is that how they're going to go back to Allah? Or has their fitrah, has their fitrah been smothered? And is their way of thinking totally changed? Their way of 
lifestyle is totally different. How are they going to go back to Allah? You on that day, on the day of judgment, will definitely be asked about the blessings that Allah gave you in this life. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا O oh, you who believe, protect yourselves and your families from the fire. From the fire. It's a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in many a hadith about the importance of the trust, when you're entrusted with something. You know, one time the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a hadith that I'm sure most of us know. كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ أَنَّ رَعِيَّتِهِ Each one of you is a shepherd and will be asked about his flock on the Day of Judgment. These children have been given to us as a trust from Allah. And Allah will ask us on the Day of Judgment, did they know Allah? Or did they neglect Allah? Did they follow the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ or not? Did they know the proper Aqeedah or not? Did they know what the word Aqeedah meant? Or they had no clue? Did they pay attention to the lifestyle of the Sahaba, the best generation, or to the lifestyle of sports stars and Hollywood actors? What were they involved in? How well did they know the Qur'an? How well did they know their deen? Allah is going to ask. Inna Allah sa'ilun kull Allah is surely going to ask each person about whatever they were put in charge of, Allah is going to ask them. Did they safeguard their trust or did they betray their trust? Did they lose their trust? What did they do with their trust? You know, one time a man came up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, akhbirni an as O oh, Messenger of Allah, tell me about the last day. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ida duyatil amana, fantadir as When you see that the trusts are lost, that the trust are totally betrayed, the trusts are forsaken, then just you wait for the hour. The hour is about to arrive. So, so the man, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Kayfa ba'atuha? Kayfa ba'atuha? Oh Messenger of Allah, what do you mean losing the trust, betraying the trust? And he said, when you see that people who are not qualified are put in charge of issues and responsibilities that they have no clue of, then wait for the hour. In other words, when you put your children in public schools and make the non-Muslims or Muslims who have no clue about the right aqidah and about the right way of thinking about Allah in charge of their way of thinking and their mindset and their perspectives, then the day of judgment is near. <coughs> if the amana is put in front of someone else that has no clue of how to deal with that amana, these children, these Muslim children, you know, one time, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man ghashana falaysa minna. Whoever betrays us is not from us. Whoever cheats us is not from us. When we do not raise up our children in the way of Allah and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
we are cheating the ummah. We're losing our children in that way. La imana liman la amana tala, said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa la deena liman la ahda la. The one who has no sense of taking care of this trust, they have no faith. This is not a fatwa from me, this is the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no deen of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is even questioning the fact whether this person is a Muslim or not. وَلَا دِينَ لِمَنْ لَا عَهْدَ له. And there is no deen for the one who has no commitment to this deen. No devotion. <clears throat> At all. وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ Woe be to the defrauders. Those people who when they want something, they get the full value of it. But when they have to measure for someone else, and they have to weigh for someone else, then they skimp a little. They cheat a little. They don't give the full value. Brothers and sisters, think about it for a moment. As adults, we often talk about our children. We talk, we talk about our children that, you know, the, you know brother, brother Imam, please teach my child how to respect an adult. Brother Imam, please teach my child how to read the Quran. Brother Imam, please teach my child how, uh, how to think right and how he shouldn't, go, uh, he, he shouldn't go out with a girlfriend and how he shouldn't do drugs and, and, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to you as an adult, you want the child to respect you. You want the 100% with the 100% birr walidain. But when it comes to them, وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ but when it comes to taking care of them and giving them their due right, you skimp a little. No, Islamic school, they cost a little bit too much. They don't have a gymnasium. They don't have a computer room. They don't have this. They don't have that. Our, our public school is free. I can send them there. يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَيْكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٌ يَوْمَ يَقُومَ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Don't they realize? That they one day are going to be raised in front of their Lord on the day of judgment, on a, on a tremendous day, on, on a horrific day. The day when everybody will stand forth in front of their Lord. Everything will be asked. This trust will be asked about. Said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma min abdin, ma min abdin. يَسْتَرْعِيهِ اللَّهِ رَعِيَّةِ يَمُوتُ يَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَهُوَ غَاشٍ لِرَعِيَّتِهِ إِلَّا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says translation of the meanings of this hadith that there is never a person who Allah has made responsible for certain people and they die when they're going to die. And they betray the people they're responsible for. Except that Allah will forbid paradise for that person. These children are a trust from Allah. If we betray this trust, our going to paradise is in question. Our going to paradise is in question. Brothers and sisters, it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility that we have to begin to take seriously. You know, the Muslims here in Michigan, in certain cities, moved here a long time ago, 150 years ago or more. But in the Americas, you know, Central America, South America, the Muslims came more than a thousand years ago. Check out the Muslim history in America. 
The Muslims moved here more than a thousand years ago. Before Leif Erikson, as we're taught here in the public schools, that the Vikings were the first ones who came. No, 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 no. The Muslims were here way before that. They had colonies in Brazil and Mexico and other places. Muslim communities. What happened? What happened? If the Muslims moved here almost seven, eight hundred years ago, uh, before the Christians and others moved into this nation, why is this nation known as a Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo nation? If the Muslims moved here first, why? We must ask ourselves. Because we did not concentrate on the very first word of our revelation. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. We did not establish schools. We did not establish educational institutions. And that's why today, the only trace of the Muslim that you see in the Americas is six, seven hundred year old graves with Arabic written on them, and so on. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a second chance. Let us not waste it this time. أَقُولُوا قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ وَاسْتَرْشِدُوهُ يُرْشِدْكُمْ وَاسْتَهْدُوهُ يَهْدِكُمْ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters You know One time a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent out a contingent, a delegation. He sent them out to certain tribes to invite them to Islam. And he appointed Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu an as the leader of this delegation. And in this delegation, they were the giants of the Ummah, like Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and Umar radiallahu an, and Ali radiallahu an, and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu an, and others. Some of the giants of this Ummah, they were in this delegation. In this delegation were also some young people, youth, not even teenagers. You, you would classify them as kids. One of those kids who was in this delegation was Qais radiallahu anhu. You see, as they went, they had to cross this desert. And as they're crossing the desert, they ran out of food. And they could not go any further. So all the Sahaba who were in this delegation, they all sat there and they, tried to be, they began trying to figure out what to do. Should they move forward or should they just go back? And even if they were to go back, they felt as if they, they would never make it because they had come out too far. So they had to figure out a way to do something. And most, most of them, they felt that the only way now, they were so badly stuck in the middle of the desert that the only way was to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to send some way to save them and to deliver them from this predicament. So as they're sitting there, Qais, he was 10 years old, what we would classify as a fifth grader by today's standards. Qais radiallahu an, he got up and he started going in different directions to the people around 
but he thought maybe some people may be around and he began looking <coughs> beyond the hills and so on. So he found this one group of people some distance away from the camp of the Sahaba. And he went up to the people and he asked them, where is your leader? And they pointed to their leader and he went up to the leader and he said, I just pay attention to how Qais is going to give us a lessons in finance 101. And this only happens from a heart that is pure, that is raised up Islamically in an Islamic environment. So Qais radiallahu an, he asked the person, he asked the leader of the, the people, I need five camels. So the man said, what are you going to do with five camels? He said, and then he explained the story that, you know, we were in this delegation and we're all stuck, we we're all stuck there and, and with, I, I want to buy five camels. So the man chuckled, he said, <laughs> you're going to buy five camels? Looking at him as a 10 year old, you, you're going to buy five camels? Who are you? So Qais, he said, no, 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 I'm very serious. I want to buy five camels for all my companions. I said, you're just a child, just a kid. Where are you, where are you going to get that money to pay me for, for these camels? So Qais, you see, he's a child. He doesn't have any credit. And the man is asking him that, what's your, what are your qualifications? So, he says, um, he uses his dad's credit, his father's credit. So he says, you know, I guarantee you that when you come to Medina, I'll pay you the, uh, the number of dates that is equal to the cost of these camels. <laughs> so the man said, who are you? What do you mean you're going to pay me all these dates? He said, they said, you don't understand. You see, my father is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And I'm telling you that if you just give me these five camels, and when you come to Medina, I'll give you in exchange the number of days that is equal to these five camels. Well, the man said, okay, but I need witnesses. I need witnesses. So he said, Qais said, okay, I, I'll go back and I'll get the witnesses. So Qais went back to the companions and he said to them, look, I found this person, he's going to give me the five camels, we'll have the food and, and we'll all be fine, we'll all live and so on. All the Sahaba, would you believe? They refused to be witnesses. They refused to be the guarantors in today's language. They refused to be the guarantors. So Qais went to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said, Wallahi la ashad. I swear by Allah, I'm not gonna be the guarantor. I'm not gonna witness this. Because the Sahaba, they felt that this is a kid, 10 years old, and how is he gonna pay anything? So, You would think that Qais would now start crying or give up, that no, nobody cares, nobody supports me, no, you know, forget it, this, I, I'll just die like everybody else. No. He went back to the man with the five camels, and he said, look, you've got to help me. Nobody is going to bear, nobody wants to be a witness, but I promise you that when you come to Medina, I'll get, I'll get you those five camels, uh, I'll get you the number of dates that will equal the price. My father is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he reminded him. So the man said, okay, fine, okay. And so he gave them the five, he gave him the five camels and he brought the five camels back to camp. And the Sahaba, each day, the first day, the second day, the third day, they slaughtered a camel for the entire delegation. On the fourth day, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu said, 
don't use those two camels because I don't think you're going to be able to pay this. And let's just go, we will be able to make it back to Medina now. Everybody is stronger now. So they headed back from Medina. In the meanwhile, in Medina, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, the father, he already had received the story of the fact that the Sahaba were stuck in the desert and they might, all of them might die. He didn't know about what his son did, but he got the news that the Sahaba were in a very bad predicament. A very bad predicament. And then Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he said to all the Sahaba who were near him in Medina, he said, but if I know my son, but if I know my son, he's going to go somewhere and he's going to try to convince somebody to get something for all the Sahaba and he's going to use my name. He's going to use my name to get that and he's going to promise them based on my, me. In today's language, based on my credit. And that's exactly what happened. So when the Muslims came back, everybody was so happy with Qais and Qais went to his father, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, and he told him what had happened. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he was so happy with his son. He said, I'm going to give you four orchards full of fruit. And you go ahead and you pay off that man. And once you paid him off, these four gardens are yours. <laughs> this entire story came to the attention of the Prophet ﷺ. Somebody came to the Prophet ﷺ and told him this entire story. <clears throat> you know what the Rasul ﷺ said? Innama qais min bayti jud. Qais is surely from a generous and honorable noble home. A very generous home. Now look at what the Prophet ﷺ said. Reflect on the word just for a moment, brothers and sisters. He said, Qais is from a very generous home. He didn't say father, he said home. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning that they had raised Qais, not just the father, but the mother as well. But the mother as well. Both the mother and the father, they had raised this child to be like this. Brothers and sisters, this is what happens when you raise a child in an Islamic environment. When you raise a child in an Islamic environment. Brothers and sisters, you know, one time, one of our scholars, he says that when he, he I mean, this incident is, would be similar to what a preschool is today. He said when he was three, his uncle told him, son, remember one thing. <laughs> Allahu ma'i. Allah is with me. Of course, you know, as you know, uh, <laughs> our belief is not Allah is with me physically. It means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you in His knowledge. He knows what you're doing. He sees what you're doing. He hears what you're doing and so on. Allahu ma'i. He said, repeat this as often as you can. He said, when I, be when I became four years old, still preschool, when I became, by today's terms, when I became four years old, he said, now remember this phrase, Allahu nazirun ilayhi. Allah is watching me. Allah is watching me. He said, repeat this as often as you can. He said, when I became five, he told me, Allahu Shahidun alayhi. Allah is witnessing everything that I am doing. In other words, there's a sense of accountability that Allah will hold you responsible now. He said, when I started repeating these three phrases, I stopped disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Brothers and sisters, you think about this just for a second. Is it true that perhaps most of the Ummah has not gone to the preschool of the Prophet ﷺ? How this world would be different if we knew that Allah was watching? If we were truly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence? That how, if we were aware that Allah is watching, Allah is hearing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every little thing that we're doing above His throne. He knows everything. <coughs> How our lives as families, as an ummah, would be totally different. Brothers and sisters, today, Islamic schools is not a choice, it's a necessity. It's a necessity. You know the lesson from more than a thousand years ago. We have no presence because we did not concentrate on education. And you cannot just teach your children in the Sunday schools and in the evening schools. They need to develop an identity, an Islamic identity. Not to just be different from the people in this nation, but to be the leaders of this nation. But you cannot raise leaders on leftovers. You cannot raise presidents on pennies. You cannot raise hearts on hand-me-downs. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, because our orientation is so dunyawi, is so worldly, that we concentrate on the materialist aspect of lives, uh, of our lives. The materialistic aspect of our lives. Brothers and sisters, it's not about grades. It's about grace. <laughs> the grace of Allah descending upon us. And that only comes when the hearts are close to Allah. It's not about just getting the best careers and the most lucrative careers. It's about having the most beautiful character. Islamic schools fit the bill. But we have to recognize and acknowledge that this is a trust that we must fulfill. Remember the sign of a munafiq. There are three signs that the Rasulullah said, Ayatul Munafiq, Salaf. There are three signs of a, of a hypocrite. <laughs> you know, the first sign, when he talks, he lies. And when he promises, he goes back on his promise. And what's the third one? And if he is entrusted with a trust, he betrays the trust. He betrays the trust. Brothers and sisters, it's not about English. Because a lot of us, were, we have this inferiority complex about our children knowing the perfect American English with a perfect accent and so on and so forth. But what good is that if they don't know the Arabic? If they cannot read the Quran? If they cannot read the... The, the tons of literature that the Muslim ulama of the past have put there for us to benefit from. It's about Arabic, it's not about English. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should not learn English. We need English for the da'wah, to give da'wah, to share the message of Islam. But the root is Arabic. We must learn the Arabic language, our children must learn the Arabic language. I don't care what background you're from. If you're a Muslim, you must learn the Arabic language. So it's not about English, it's about the Arabic. Brothers and sisters, it's not about social studies, it's about soul studies. Tarbiyatul nafs, tazkiyatul nafs, the purification of the soul that can only come through an Islamic school because that's the core of the curriculum of an Islamic school, the purification of the soul. Whoever, the person who purifies his soul will be successful. The person who putrefies his soul, ruins his soul, corrupts his soul, that's the person who will be a miserable failure. So it's not about social studies. 
It's not just about social studies, but more importantly, it's about soul studies. It's not just about math, it's about morals. It's not just about science, but it's more importantly about the conscience. The taqwa, the conscience, to recognize, acknowledge the presence of Allah and to fear Allah and to be in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, I'll leave you with this one last thing. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu was so protective of the children of this ummah. He used to do, he would do anything for the children of this ummah. One time, he was, he hadn't eaten for about three, four days, and his stomach was growling. His stomach was growling. And he began talking to his stomach, and he said, Wallahi, لَن تَشْبَعِي حَتَّى يَشْبَعَ أَطْفَالُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He said, grumble and rumble and do it or don't do it, I don't care. I swear by Allah that you will never be full until the stomachs of the Muslim children are full. Brothers and sisters, these children, Allah has blessed us with. It's an amana, it's a trust. How are you going to send them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Messed up or muttaqeen? Which way? And they're certainly not going to be muttaqeen if you dump them in the public schools. <coughs> we need Islamic schools. We need to support Islamic schools. And that's the way for this ummah to survive. Not only that, but this is the future of America. This is the future of America. America needs to see leaders with solutions, not just with talk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa qina athab al-nar. Rabbana la tajab qulubana ba'da idha daytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmah in hadanta al-wahab wa qina s-salam. Allah.